Hey everybody, Noah here with Learn Meta Analysis, and let's talk in this video about systematic review data analysis. Now, I'm going to warn you, this is going to be a relatively short video considering the content that it's actually covering. And the reason is because there's so many variations of this, so we're really probably going to want to look at examples later. But this will at least get you in the general ballpark of what it is that we're aiming to do when we're synthesizing this data. So in this video, uh, by the time we get to the end, you'll be able to explain how to use qualitative analysis techniques to help you analyze systematic review data. OK, so at the risk of sounding a little bit crazy, it's all about patterns, right? So uh, I say this a lot, when I'm, especially when I'm talking with students. Everything is about patterns. And in this case, it's about those you see and those you don't necessarily see at surface level. So the specific analysis type is really going to depend on what you're investigating. So a lot of this is contextual. But a lot of times what we're using is some form or variant of thematic analysis. So we're trying to find themes within our data. And I refer to themes as patterns simply because uh, I find that the average person understands the word patterns um, when I say I'm looking for patterns more than when I say I'm looking for themes. Uh, when I say I'm looking for themes, they, they sometimes question me what I mean by a theme. Uh, but when I say pattern in normal conversation, people tend to understand that. So we're gonna conduct some form of thematic analysis, generally speaking. And we often are using a mixed methods approach with a lean towards qualitative. So what does this mean? Well, generally speaking, what this means is that we have some sort of descriptive statistics that are telling us about the nature of our sample. Um, and we may say things like, oh, 60% of the sample found this, or 40% of the sample found this. So that's what I mean when I say that it's mixed methods with a lean towards qualitative. We have a little bit of quantitative information in there in the sense of it's like percentages, but really the guts and the really important part of our message is going to be qualitative and an analysis and the synthesis of the patterns and themes that we saw in this data. So let's take a look at, as, at an example. This is the example we've been working with throughout all the videos so far uh, for systematic reviews, which is examining how a pedagogical agent, a virtual character, uh, how their design can impact learning. So our first research question might be, what are the publication trends in the field? And here we're probably just going to be using a descriptive analysis. We might be talking about the number of publications over time, or we might be talking about where these publications are happening, either in journals, book chapters, conferences, etc. Our second research question might be, how are researchers designing pedagogical agents? And again, this is likely going to be descriptive. It's probably going to be something to the effect of like 60% of research studies we located uh, use characters that were designed to play this role, whereas 30% were designed to play this role. Or we might talk about the character's age or any other of these design factors. But the point being that with the phrasing of this question, it is largely descriptive information, right? It's not necessarily asking you to do any real synthesis outside of providing descriptive statistics. Now here is where we get into what is actually, in my opinion, some of the most informative information we can start looking at and where a lot of systematic reviews really end up finding the good stuff, so to speak, or the interesting stuff, what I would call more scientifically interesting as well as intellectually interesting. So how do different design features influence learning outcomes. So really what this is talking about here is it's looking at multiple levels of the data together and synthesizing it into one or a couple coherent findings, right, or patterns. So what might we do to actually facilitate this analysis? Well, first thing that we might do is in the area of virtual characters and pedagogical agents, we actually have an existing design framework. It was published by Heidegg and Clairbout in 2011. So we're, what we might do with this is take our data and code it based upon this framework. And that gets us into some useful groupings, right? That gets us, uh, I guess you could use the word themes if you wanted to, um, but you could, I, I'm gonna use the word clusters or groups because I think it's more accurate, but you can start grouping your studies based upon what level of the design framework they're at and what they are actually examining. So that gets us our first step. Then once we have that, we're gonna start looking for those patterns, right? We're gonna start looking for those themes within each level. So let's say we're on the medium level uh, of their framework. So their framework has three levels. One's global, one's medium, one's detail. Let's take a look at that medium level, hypothetically. And let's say you have 15 studies looking at animation. Well, what you can do then is you can start looking for patterns within that subgroup. What were they actually investigating in relation to animation and how did these things actually influence learning outcomes? This will help you be able to actually draw conclusions about what effects animation has on learning. 
And this is essentially what I just said, examine how these patterns are starting to influence learning outcomes. Now, I make a note here that this sounds easy, right? It, it really sounds very simple. Oh, you just code according to some framework and you know these patterns will come together. In reality, this is time consuming, okay? And this requires a lot of brain work. It's not usually something you can just sit down and like figure out in 15 minutes. I mean, sometimes there's really obvious patterns, but my experience has been that oftentimes there's not. Oftentimes we end up with mixed results or we have uh, kind of a scattered research field perhaps that doesn't necessarily have systematic lines of research looking at similar things. So as a systematic reviewer, this is very difficult brain work in a lot of cases to be able to identify what these patterns and themes are within our data and synthesize what that actually means in relation to our outcome of interest. But that is what makes systematic reviews unique. Okay, That is what separates them from scoping reviews. That is what separates them from meta-analysis. They're examining it in a different way than meta-analysis is examining it. So this here is the meat of a systematic review. This is the part that researchers uh, are probably going to care about the most when they read your study, is this synthesis. So I really encourage you when you're designing your research questions to make sure that you design questions that actually require you to synthesize data in a meaningful way, not just describe what's there, because we wanna do that research synthesis. So um, just as another practical example here, one of the questions that you might ask is, do humanoid agents, those that look kind of human-like, lead to better learning outcomes than non-humanoid agents? That might be one of those patterns that you want to investigate if you find sufficient studies investigating that type of thing. All right, so quick summary. I know this was a very short video. You're probably going to have some mixture of qualitative and descriptive statistics. Uh, so. This is by far what I see most commonly in systematic reviews, is we have some sort of descriptive statistic to describe the sample, but the actual meaningful, in my opinion, the meaningful information is really about the synthesis and what the researchers are telling us all of these studies mean together rather than what they mean individually. So one question is, is this open coding or is it kind of closed coding or is it kind of both? Well, as you saw in the previous example, we kind of used a combination of both, right? Because we started out with a little bit of closed coding because we already knew our categories from the framework. But then after that, we'd go after this using open coding and trying to see what patterns are emerging from those studies within each level of the framework. So you, you might end up using open coding. You might end up using closed coding. You might use both. It really just depends on your research questions and your research area. Last but not least, the key to this whole process is synthesis. When you do a systematic review, at the end of the day, you wanna be able to tell us something new, right? You don't wanna just say, oh, we have 45 studies and they found something that you could have known from reading one study's abstract, right? That's, that's not really what systematic review should strive for. In a systematic review, we should be striving to synthesize the existing evidence in the field and be able to walk away with a new, more in-depth understanding than we had when we started the process. So really aim for your studies to have a good amount of synthesis. Personally, I feel this is the key with systematic reviews as compared to a scoping review, for example. Scoping reviews tend to be very descriptive. Systematic reviews should be very analytical and provide a lot of synthesis. So this pretty much wraps up our video on data analysis for systematic review. Hopefully this conceptual overview has clarified some of the questions that you might have had. Thank you guys for watching and I'll see you in the next video.